Hello and welcome to Auto Save. My name is Nick Andrade and I'm here with my co-host Camille Salazar Hathaway as always. And today it's another special day for us as we are bringing you our very first episode of our brand new game that we are playing. And obviously you can tell by the title it is Jedi Fallen Order. Cam, initial thoughts of why we decided to do this. I know we already had our teaser episode, but maybe give uh, the audience again a little intro as to why uh star wars i mean star wars is like one of the biggest franchises in media out there like in any medium so i think it's only right as nerds that we explore (laughs) a highly acclaimed game that we haven't fully experienced yeah so you haven't played it no and i stopped playing it i fizzled out on it (laughs) But um, I, I guess I mean, we can... <laughs> Nick's on the fence on whether he wants to jump back into it. <laughs> no, I, I do. I do actually want to jump back into it. OK, I want to know why I fizzled out. But when this game first came out, like what were your initial thoughts on this you know, new franchise that had popped up from EA? Yeah, well, EA Battlefront, I mean, yeah, good game, but issues all around. So I was very hesitant when this game first came out uh, as to whether I wanted to play. I think for a lot of fans of the franchise, they were waiting for like a really good first person story driven Star Wars game. And quite frankly, I didn't think this would deliver. I don't know. There's something about the protagonist, his like look. I don't know. Oh, yeah, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) It's not intriguing to me. So it kind of, I think it flew under the radar because I actually am playing this on Game Pass. Uh, So if you have Game Pass, you could actually download this game as part of the subscription. So I downloaded it long time ago when it became available on Game Pass. And it was just one of those games in my backlog. And it's actually one of the first games that would show up for me. I don't know what it was. It just something did not intrigue me about this game at first but here we are i think for me like it really intrigued me to start and i was really excited and i got into it and i thought it was really exciting and then there's a point where maybe some of these tasks became a little annoying slash i got lost and i could never recover from that so this time around i want to come in fully immersed and you know really pay attention yeah. To every aspect of this game. So I want to know clearly why I did. Because it, it is a thing like we do play games where uh, most of these games are knockouts in terms of yeah. like they're just pure hits. And this is a hit, but it is controversial hit. We want to find out and dive into why exactly maybe audiences don't like it as much as some other Star Wars games maybe. Yeah, definitely. And I, I mean... <laughs> It sounds like we're like dreading going into this no, game, no, but no. we, but we aren't, we aren't. I think, you know, when you have a franchise that's so pop culture, there's two things that could happen. One, you kind of become underwhelmed because there's a new thing coming out every couple months around the franchise. And then it kind of, anything new that may attract you may be good for you kind of gets lost in that noise. Or two, there's lots of disappointment with maybe recent things that came out around the franchise that just doesn't interest you because of that disappointment, right? Like the movies that would have been out around this time. So I think for me, it was like a little bit of both. But hey, I'm always good for a good Star Wars adventure. I don't know. Like, okay, so as a Star Wars kind of fan... Uh, I wouldn't say like I'm a hardcore fan because Star Trek's my life, Picard forever. As a Star Wars kind of fan, I've always wondered, and this is like tinfoil hat, like I know this is probably not in the game, whatever happened to Jar Jar Binks? Whatever happened to Jar Jar Binks? This five years after Order 66, I want to know. So you're hoping that he's in this game? Yes. Okay, so we want to, and, and we know that this This game is connected to (laughs) that story of Star Wars. Yes. It happens five years after Order 66. Who knows if we see Obi-Wan or other characters pop up. We're not really sure, but I'm guessing that they would potentially because this is strictly right after the Clone Wars. 
So exactly. I'm excited in that aspect. You mentioned the movies and Star Wars. I wanted to mention Star Wars Burnout. Do you think that there was a point? I don't necessarily think as much now because of you know shows like The Mandalorian mm-hmm. that have kind of risen above. Is there a point or was there a point where there was Star Wars Burnout? Because I'll tell you, The Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker really, really did me into being uh, pretty sad about the franchise. It felt Game of Thronesy to me at ah, that point okay. because the original trilogy had all this and then The Force Awakens I felt had such an amazing comeback even though it did rip off a bunch of stuff from a new hope and whatnot but i i really liked it and i liked to where i like to see where it went and then it kind of fell off a cliff i feel like again like you mentioned this game comes out at the wrong time and maybe if it came out a few years later or before you know a lot of people might not have felt the way they did about it yeah it came out the same year as rise of skywalker and i guess like that was disappointing yeah <laughs> That was disappointing, and I guess there was a lot of negative ideas around the latest movie, and then maybe, I don't know if lots of Star Wars fans were looking to for redemption in this as a game, but yeah, I think there was a lot of burnout, not just because the, the movie was everywhere and marketing for the movie was everywhere, you were just hearing about it, and you were hearing bad things about it, so maybe that influenced my idea of the video game as well, yeah. but yeah, you know, as for the movies... Force Awakens was such a good movie. It was I think if it came out even a, alongside the resurgence of Star Wars, Star Wars mania, because when The Force Awakens came out, it was like there wasn't too much happening with Star Wars outside of Clone Wars. So I think that would have been a perfect time like to be like, and we got a game. Which I think they did, though. If I remember correctly, there was a few games. Like, that was it Battlefront? At E3, I'm pretty sure there was like a Bounty Hunter game that was in the works that never saw the light of day. I think you're right. They announced those things, but they never happen. They never right? happen. So it's like in terms of gamers getting their hands on it, not happening around that time, right? So uh, I think if this game released alongside the first one, it would have been great. Well, it was popular despite, you know, maybe some people's thoughts on it because there is a sequel coming. It is called Jedi Survivor. It will continue the story. Uh, This one obviously leaves off on, so I'm excited for that at least. However, this is a Respawn slash EA game, and Lucasfilm has announced, I think in 2021, that they are no longer going to be working with EA uh, on Mm -hmm. Star Wars games. Their partnership. Kind of rocky. Again, EA, a lot of bugs, a lot of problems, a lot of controversy with their games, their Star Wars games at least. Do you think they've done enough with this franchise? Absolutely not. You think that they should do more? They should have done more with the franchise. I think after Battlefield and the hiccups they had there, in a smart move on their end, they kind of took a step back and like was trying to fix all the pay-to-win type of features in the game with Battlefront 2. But it was just very much like there was I think there wasn't enough around this. Like the, it's Star Wars. People love the lore. You got to sell the lore of the game. And I feel like of the franchise. Sorry. And I feel like their games did not do that up until this point. And I think maybe that's why a lot of fans like this game is because of the story, apparently. So I feel like if they focus more on like a story More on story-driven games or games with, like, really cool mechanics, then yes. We'll see, and we'll see what happens with the next game, and we'll see what happens with this game, which we are going to play, starting with Chapter 1, after the break, on autosave. It's Jedi Fallen Order. Set your rhythm, Cal, but the boss wants a word. It's gonna be good for us. Here he is, Chief. An error has been detected on line 10A. All our clamps are jammed. I need two workers to climb up and secure the cables. That's not an easy maneuver. 
The guild will double your pay for this shift. Come on, Cal. Well, it's a score. That couldn't hurt. Huh? Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Get to work. This way. I'm right behind you. So I love the song to start the game. It sounded very Star Wars-y. And yeah. I was big into it. But this is the first time I think I've ever seen headphones in a Star Wars game. Do they have MP3s in <laughs> those galaxies? No, they have droids. It's like a mini, probably a mini droid that just sits on your shoulder or just latches onto your bell and just plays the hottest tunes from Tatooine. Tatooine or Tatooine? Is it Tatooine? I thought oh my it was gosh. always Tatooine. <laughs> what? <laughs> Tatooine? I've been... What? Have you been saying it wrong for your entire yes. life? Yes. Oh my god, that's oh okay because I, I there's there's also references I know that I say wrong, and it will probably come no, to at some point. This is a huge one. Oh no, it's all People right. They're gonna call okay. me out. It's okay. <laughs> so we meet our main character, Cal Kettis, by the way, played by the well-known actor Cameron Moynihan of Gotham slash Shameless fame. Cam, I yeah. I laughed in the first segment because. You said you hated the way this character looked, but it is literally depicted by a person. It is molded into the way he looks. I didn't, so okay, you literally firstly, hate I didn't him say, the way he looks. I, I didn't say I hated the way he looks. I said there's just <laughs> something about how he looks that's not intriguing to me. But that's a, Maybe that's a real life person. A, I know, but this is Star Wars, okay? There's a lot of elaborate characters. Maybe if there was a scar on the face or a, like alien, I'd be more intrigued. It just it's funny to me that you <laughs> you just don't like his face. <laughs> but it's so like bad. it's like it's not like Kratos or Atreus who are like based on a model character. It's literally yeah. based on a human being who is playing yeah. the character. So Yeah. I'm sorry, Cameron, if you're, if you're listening. Uh, I think you're an incredible actor and you are an incredible actor. Hey, I didn't actor say, Ca- I Jedi. did not. Hey, I did not say he's not an incredible actor. I just said for Star Wars, I wanted a more elaborate look. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Understood. So maybe you think it should have been an alien, right? Yeah. Like, I, I love playing as aliens. That makes more sense. It's like, especially, and this is my thing with Star Wars. Star Wars does this thing where every like movie, there's like lots of deserty, sandy areas. You're telling me no, like there's very little lush worlds. And then secondly, we're always like following a human. Why? It's true. Why? I think as people resonate resonate with humans more. I think that's why. I mean, Baby Yoda was the star of the Mandalorian. Really, took that, that is home. True. That is true. Okay. <laughs> Good point. Good point. So basically, there's two workers, Cal and his friend Prof, uh, and they need to secure some cables. So that's where we come in. Looks like Cal is some sort of junkyard worker because they are stripping parts of old Republic ships. And our mission is to climb and find our way there. But when we do, we stumble upon what looks like a ship. Those Jedi. Real tragedy. I've always said they couldn't all be traitors. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I guess it's just our lucky day. Empire's gonna get a lot of good material out of it. Yeah, here we are, scrapping these ships from the war just so they can turn around and make new ones. What a racket, huh? All of us risking our necks for the bosses. And the pay was better back during the Republic, too. Hey, you really should watch what you say. Listen to me. Find us free like this? Could be your ticket off this soggy rock. What makes you think I want out of here? <laughs> Come on, Cal, you're a young guy. You don't end up like me. <sighs> Eventually, you gotta move on and live your life. Find your destiny. So it looks like Cal has been there for five years. That was his ship because Prof says, oh, four, it's been here four years, but Cal interjects with the fifth year. So we know that, we clearly know, obviously from the trailers and stuff, that Cal is the Jedi. But now we kind of get confirmation. That went over my head. It did. I did not realize that. Okay. At all. Wow. I just saw him like kind of. You're just staring at Cal's face, right? And you're like, I can't stand this character. (laughs) No, No, I was just like, I saw him touch like the emblem and I was like, 
huh, I wonder what's going I didn't think that was his ship, but that makes complete sense now. Prof says basically, Cal, like you're young. Why don't you live your life? Find your destiny. And Cal is kind of, I think he's scared at the moment. Uh, we don't know too much about him yet, but he's in this place. He's a junkyard worker for a reason. He's trying to hide from the now empire. But maybe those words do resonate with Cal a little bit about finding his destiny because he feels a little bit stuck. It seems like he's trusting of Prof, but he doesn't want to fully tell Prof like what's going on in his head. And obviously that's probably because he's force sensitive. So I don't know. At this point, I was just kind of like, maybe he doesn't want to like be a Jedi or like doesn't want to be yep. involved like he's turning his back on destiny rather than being afraid that's kind of how i read it where it's not necessarily fear but like he's choosing to turn his back on whatever he believes in that's a good point considering most of those the jedi that are still alive almost feel that way because they have to once uh we go and fix the cables again there's a lot of climbing to do one breaks and it sends cal and prof crashing down but cal saves prof by using the force basically prof is like well okay i guess you're a jedi and he confronts cal about the force and cal pretty much confirms to the audience and to prof himself that he is a jedi which i can't believe he did that so fast he's got to keep secrets better also, I don't trust Prof. I did not trust Prof when Why I not? first met Prof. He seems like a nice like, know, construction like, worker guy. Like, I don't know. He'd be like in his mid 50s if he lived I on the I feel like Earth. given Star Wars like movies, it's like the person that you think is like your friend always betrays you somehow. So I was like, no, Cal, don't don't tell Prof. Like, he may seem like a good guy, but I don't trust Prof. That was that was my instincts. Okay, I, I can understand that because again, we're we're relatively new into this game, and it seems like it's happening really fast. So we it, we can't yeah, really trust is. Prof at the moment. On the train back home, Prof tells Cal that it's probably a good idea to leave this place and be safe. As we're on the train, though, Cal falls asleep, and we end up uh, what looks like on an Imperial ship, and it's actually a vision from Cal's master, Jaro Tapple, who. We assume, I guess, is dead because of Order 66. And he tells his apprentice to trust only in the force. And that's when he wakes up. What do you think about that? Clearly, he's in danger. Yeah, but this whole scene was so trippy. It was. Like when he, because yeah. you're playing through it, right? So you're you're following or you're seeing, you're not playing through actually. You're seeing him walk towards Prof. But it, it kind of like gave me this vibe of like the Force Awakens. Like, you know, Ray, when she's discovering her power, she starts having these visions. Yes. And I really like that that element. That was actually one thing from the new trilogy that I really enjoyed that I really haven't seen in previous uh, Star Wars movies. The idea of like visions, right? And like seeing them play out and be really trippy. So I really like that. Well, the train stops, Cam. And stormtroopers ask for some identification. And that's when, uh oh, some inquisitors show up looking for a Jedi. I, uh, I've been working on this heap a long time. Way before the war. We refit and rebuilt ships. Best in the galaxy. Then came the Empire. And engineers became scrappers. The workers? They just started getting worked. Oh. We all know the truth. We're just too afraid to say it. To the Empire, we're all just expendable. Yes, you are. <laughs> No! So, Cam, you did say that you didn't trust Prof. I know. Uh, so bad. I guess he, in the end, you could trust him. He was just trying to stall, I think. Yeah. I really thought he would betray us. I really did. I feel so bad. That's okay. Again, construction worker in his 50s, loyal. 
Okay, that's <laughs> I come from a long line of Portuguese construction workers, okay? <laughs> we are all loyal to a T. But do you think Cal was too quick to draw his lightsaber and show himself? Because to me, I thought it wasn't that I, I get I guess I get that this is your friend. But it didn't seem that emotional, I guess, because we had just jumped into this game. But he was yeah. quick to draw his lightsaber. And I thought, Cal, uh, probably not a good idea, buddy. Yeah, that's what it is. It was not very, I guess I wasn't emotionally invested because we were kind of just thrown into the situation like off the bat. I have a few problems with this scene. The main one being Cal literally has his lightsaber drawn already in his hand. He's just angled a little bit. But when you see that, that it goes wider and you see the second sister kind of talking to the crowd, you clearly see the lightsaber in Cal's hand. So you're telling me they never, they didn't see the lightsaber. They didn't know he was the Jedi from the start. And yeah, I do think that he did pull the lightsaber a little too quick. You know, you're there for five years trying to be undercover and I get that there's obviously this connection between him and Prof, but I thought, especially as a Jedi, he would have a little bit more control, and I thought there would have been more of a back and forth between him and the second sister uh, before the lightsaber was drawn. Yeah, and normally when a main character does reveal themselves, it's not for, you know, their friend who is a construction worker, I, I would feel like there would have to be some sort of more emotional connection right off the bat to feel some sort of way. But you know, I guess not. I guess they got to go uh, make this fast and furious so that we can find out <laughs> what Cal is about as a Jedi. Uh, do you think it was smart for the ninth sister to hold Cal over a cliff because he flailed and falls? Uh, but it seems like a stupid move. It's like, you had the Jedi. Let me put him over a cliff right away. And then, oops, he fell. My bad. Plus, I mean, let me hold him over a cliff, drop him, because we all know that Jedis just fall because they aren't force sensitive. They can't control the right. force and land like Come a on. soft landing. Come on. Come yeah. on. Come on. You're inquisitors. You should know better. <laughs> I also I had to rewind the tape because... I <laughs> I went on YouTube and I, I looked at the video again. At first, I thought, okay, Cal, they they are the ninth sister drops Cal on purpose, which you would uh, think okay. you would think, okay, he's gonna save himself, so that's a dumb move. But Cal actually does because he flails with his lightsaber. He he drops, so it is Cal <laughs> who does it. It isn't the ninth yeah. sister. So I at first was gonna flame the ninth sister for doing that, but Cal did. Make it happen. Oh, good observation. Yeah, good observation. So we do fall, and guess what? It's time to fight some stormtroopers in our lightsaber tutorial. Yeah. Initial thoughts on lightsaber fighting. So cool. And I think this is why they kind of rushed the beginning, or I'm hoping so, because you're hopping into a Star Wars game. You want to just wield a lightsaber and have lots of fun. This whole tutorial, it didn't really feel like a tutorial for me. It felt like I was actually going through like these little uh, snippets of like gameplay were actually needed for the progression of the story, which I really enjoyed. And it's it's not just, I guess I won't mention it, but it's it's the mechanic with the lightsaber. Mm -hmm. I find in like, it's pretty standard in terms of like dodging and then pressing like LB, I think it is on the Xbox controller. Like if, if a stormtrooper is shooting at you to reflect those shots. I will say with the controls, though, I, I kept getting confused, and I don't know about you, but I kept wanting to play X for my action items, like, to yeah. to interact with everything instead of A, because usually it would be, like, that that side button to interact, but then it's not. Is that just me a me thing? And I found climbing was weird, how you have to confirm you're going to climb with left trigger. Yes, it, it's very confusing. I want to get more into that in the third segment because I think mm -hmm. there's a lot to talk about there, but I agree with okay, you. Okay, okay. A lot of the controls are weird. They are, but you. surprisingly, I would say the lightsaber fighting is actually pretty standard. It's the best part of it all. I really yeah. do. <laughs> I really do like the lightsaber fighting. But as Cam mentioned, we have to climb. We have to run, climb, jump, do a lot of those things as we're trying to escape the Inquisitor ship. It's a weird situation where another ship shows up 
Uh, and this person who calls herself Seer is trying to rescue us, but we don't know what's going on. But we, we end up slipping as we're trying to get to the ship and we fall into a pit where, of course, the second sister shows up. Going somewhere. I recognize that stance. Perhaps you've had some training after all. Who was your master? Padawan? Someone I killed, perhaps? What Jedi gave their life so that you might live? So this really isn't a boss battle, more so than you have to just survive. Uh, because the second sister is really strong. You just have to ward her off enough so Seer can actually rescue Cal. But I think it's a really cool moment and it's a really cool glimpse into what lightsaber fighting can be, especially when the two are like neck and neck and their mm -hmm. lightsabers are clashing and it's making this cool 3D. I was, I was playing on my big screen at night, uh, so it was really amplifying, especially I have lights in the back of my TV and it was really cool. But I really like, I don't know, I the second sister seems like a cool character yeah. that we're going to dive into as well. She does seem like a really cool villain that's menacing or like also not that's menacing, but also maybe is like a newer inquisitor. Yes. I'm um, like, she seems like there's just like a rawness to her that I really enjoy. Like she's not perfect at all from like the little bits that we saw her. But she I, I'm guessing she would probably be like the main villain. I would think so. It, it seems mm -hmm. like it's making that especially she's the second sister to the Grand Inquisitor. By the way, the Inquisitors in the last, you know, five years, they've taken a big step. I know. Uh, they're basically all the enemies in all the Star Wars uh, things right now, like Rebels, uh, Obi-Wan, yep. this game. So I, I, I hope that second sister could do justice uh, to the Inquisitors and add a new fiery edge that we would love to see. Uh, Cal does make it to the ship with Seer and is now on a ship called the Mantis. And we're introduced to the crew. Who are you? Cal. Kestis. Who was that back there? An Imperial Inquisitor. She's a Force user hunting Jedi survivors. And now that she knows who you are, she will not stop until she destroys you. How do you know so much? And why'd you help me? We track Imperial communications. We heard the Inquisitors were heading to Brock. So we made our move. Oh, yeah? And what's the bounty on Jedi these days anyway? That's gratitude for you. Look, I get it. You've been surviving on your own for so long that it's impossible to trust anyone. And it's what's kept you alive. But this is about something bigger than just surviving. Like what? Like rebuilding the Jedi Order. So straight off the bat, Cam, do you trust Seer? Uh, because I know in previous games, uh, you don't trust some of these characters. I know, right? Quite fast. But like Cal says, uh, how does she know so much? She wants to rebuild the Jedi Order. Like, this just seems like a lot of information that she's throwing at Cal right away, and it seems suspicious. Yeah, uh, she does seem suspicious, but she also just saved me from uh, the second sister, so I kind of trust her. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I kind of trust her, um, but I do think maybe she has her own agenda that will be revealed throughout the game. So although I trust her right now because we probably have like a main a common interest or a common enemy i am also having her like at arm's length because there she may just do something for her own gain we also meet grease who seems like in my uh humble opinion i wrote down new york gabagool he's got like a track suit and he, <laughs> you know that guy that meme where he's like hey where's the gabagool yeah, like yeah, that's yeah, yeah, he's yeah. wearing that like red track suit like, he could probably be in The Sopranos, uh, the alien version of The Sopranos. I really like him off the bat. He has, his, he has a bald head and, and a beard. It's pretty funny. Yeah, I like his humor. He's like, we're not good enough for you. <laughs> it's very much, yeah, yeah New York, have a cool. Hey, we're not good enough for you. Yeah, I love it. So we're on this ship. Cal has this scene where he plays space guitar, which I thought was funny. <laughs> He just picks up a random like piccolo or whatever. No, not piccolo is a flute. Sorry. Yeah, that's uh, different. But it's like it, it looks like one of those like Spanish, like a sp oh, yeah, yeah. a Spanish old timey night fifteen hundreds. Yeah, like a f no, not a flute, the a lute, 
A lute. A lute, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. A lute. Yeah, 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 a lute. Obviously, we know our instruments, yeah. <laughs> it's like a bard, a bard guitar. But that was pretty funny. She, and then Sears so like, so oh, weird. you can play? And he's like, oh, I can feel it through the force of blah, blah, blah. But I thought that was really cool. He has this, like, force echo ability. And I do like seeing Jedis with, like, different types of abilities because the force is so vast. There has to be some diversity in ability so i like this uh, force echo thing yeah the echo it kind of like he can trace back memories yeah with objects like. yeah oh, and seer tells us there aren't too many jedis that could do that oh wow wow okay how does she know they do have a conversation seer and cal where he mentions that his connection with the force is damaged and mm. that means when he loses control, when he when he when his guard goes down, he can maybe potentially he doesn't say this, but what I interpret it as is that he can be turned to the dark side because it seems like he's quick to anger, oh. uh, which is obviously the number one thing you can't do as a Jedi. He's a Sith, <laughs> soon to be Sith. Uh, no, I I did not take this for the dark side. I just thought you know like. Because of the time, a lot of Jedi's may be turning their back on the Force and lose that yes. connection. So it's not. I didn't take it as like his losing control is like turning to the dark side. I took it more as like him losing control is showing that like he may be losing that grasp on the Force because he's turned his back oh, okay. on the Jedi. Okay. Wow, I didn't even think about that at all. That's a great point. Yeah. We'll see what it is. Maybe he ends up being a Darth at the end of the game. Who knows? I know. That would actually be pretty cool. That's really interesting. And actually, that explains a lot, like, why he frailed, like, when he was being held by the Ninth Sister and, like, he kind of lost control there and fell, right? Like, and ah. even with him trying to use the Force to save Prof, like, I feel like he could have done that better if he was more connected to it. Oh, it makes sense. It's on to Bogano our new planet that we're going to because Seer tells us that she needs 8 million things for us to do all of a sudden, <laughs> even though we just met her. So let's trust her immediately. We have to go to a Jedi <laughs> vault that the Empire does not know exists on this planet, Pagano. But we have to trust her, I guess. And this is where we end up in the planet. We get to explore a little bit here. This is the first time where we kind of get to explore our surroundings. We find a meditation circle. That's where we can upgrade skills save, heal. What do you think about those? Again, this is where the right analog stick comes in, where you have to press. And I always forget because I'm pressing X or A or whatever button it is or B or whatever. I don't know what it is for Xbox. And it's it's kind of strange, but uh, there adds a feature where if you, if you heal yourself, all the enemies respawn as well, which is something I really hate in this game. Yeah, yeah. It's like you really have to think about when you're going to heal yourself if it's the right time to do that. But I do like this uh, interface for like a skill tree. We do see Jedi Masters meditate a lot, but we don't necessarily have an idea of what that may look like. And now we know they're just upgrading their skills on a skill tree in a video game. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. It yeah. makes sense, but I like it. It's a great point to mention, like meditation circles. We never really see what that looks like. No, we And now don't. we can kind of see those. It's almost like a tree. And it's and like it's, very. It, yeah. It's like exploring that whole vision side of things with Jedis and like just how in tune they are with the force that it does sometimes. It, it's just a lot of, I don't know, weird things that could happen. Weird visuals that you can see that I'm really excited to explore because it seems like this game is going to do that more and more. After our meditation, well, we find a droid. Hey, BD-1. I'm Cal. Uh, yeah, I'm okay. I'm just I'm looking for someone. No, not you. I'm searching for a, a Jedi, I think. Hold on. Y you know the Jedi? What do you know? Wait, hold on! So we meet BD-1. Do you like... BD-1, he's a nice oh little God. cute droid. So adorable, so cute. I was waiting for a droid buddy. I really wanted a droid buddy uh, just because that's classic of Star Wars. So I'm glad we got this like cute little drone. I, I just love cute mm -hmm. little companions. Yeah, he's uh, he seems like he's going to be another, you know, R2 character type where they're normally there's always they're kind of like a little aggressive or funny or 
They have some sort of personality, and it seems like BD1 has that type of personality. Moving on to Bogano, like we can't access everything we stumble upon right now. It looks like yeah. there are barriers, or we need new force powers or other different things. So it looks like we'll have to come back to this planet at some point when we have more unlocked skills and stuff like that. We also find the force essence, which we can upgrade skills based on how many essences we get, which is also cool. And we also find a workbench uh, where we can upgrade our lightsaber. I immediately changed the color of mine. What did you do? Did you keep it the same or did you did you change it? I kept bit? it the same. Ugh. I kept it the same. No. I did. I know. I know. I like the blue. I like the blue. I just I thought I just bought the regular version of Jedi Fallen Order, but I had premium access oh. to an orange lightsaber color and also some other parts of the lightsaber. So I changed the way the lightsaber looked and then I also changed it to the color green which I much prefer over the blue lightsaber color because I think the blue lightsaber color, too many Jedis have that color. It's too normy. It's too <laughs> normy for a Jedi. What would your like favorite? Purple. It would be purple? Yeah. Okay. I loved Mace Windu's uh, lightsaber for that. The only Jedi that you've seen with that. Yes, that's true. I And Cam, Cam the Jedi as well. Yes, yes. I think there is purple though in this game that we can unlock. Yes. So once is, that I comes, so. would you like, because I know that at some point, because I played the game before, you can do two lightsabers, you can do double-edged lightsaber. Ooh. What would you be a fan of the most? I didn't know you could do that later on. Uh, I would probably Spoiler, do like, sorry. A, thanks, a double-edged lightsaber. Yeah. That seems like something yeah. you would do. I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what does that mean? What I have no idea, do? but I think... Oh, I dual lightsaber, two lightsabers okay. in each hand. That's always something. Knights of the Old Republic, whatever games I can get my hands on, if I can get two lightsabers, that's the way to go. But let's stop geeking out about lightsabers for a bit and talk more about <laughs> what we're playing. And BD1 can give us healing stims, which is a nice little feature as well. We can also find echoes around from different areas in Bogano, I guess people who died here and we can get experience points from that as well. We can fight a bunch of things. And that's where we end up in a place where we see some alien animals. They look like salamanders that can, they, they have some sort of ability and there's a little marking on the wall that we touch and we get another cutscene where we see our master, uh, Jaro, who is teaching us how to wall run. And once you get that ability, I guess once you master it in his training, you then go back to the real world and get that ability. What did you think about that skill and that whole uh, thing where we kind of go back in time and learn from our master? I think that's a perfect way to do it. I don't know if it makes sense for Cal. Like, why wouldn't Cal remember how to wall run before seeing that vision? Like, there's no... Uh, like, he doesn't have amnesia. Like, there's no reason why he wouldn't remember that. So I found that kind of weird because you have access to these areas you could wall run, but you can't wall run until you have that vision. Um, but I guess for game mechanics, like, it makes sense if you want to unlock certain mechanics to have these visions where you go back. I think what I made me understand is when Cal mentioned that his his connection with the Force is damaged, I feel like he also doesn't remember a lot of things. And we're now trying to put the pieces together of everything that he's okay. forgotten. That's at least my interpretation. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Uh, well, going to the vault, there's obviously that wall run there that we have to get to in order to unlock this vault. So once we get that skill, we can go back to the I call temple, but I guess it's a vault. And we can use our force wall run, I guess it would be called. Yep. To get to the area. Force wall run? Yes. I guess you have to add force to everything in order for it to be Jedi. Yes, exactly. So the force wall run <laughs> gets us to the vault. And once inside. I am Master Eno Cordova. I may not know your name, but I know your purpose. The fate of the Jedi Order lies in your hands. This place, this vault is a sacred temple built by a vanished civilization known as the Zephyr. Meditating here, I was granted a premonition through the Force, a vision of doom. I have placed inside this vault a Jedi holocron containing a list of the names and locations of young Force sensitives throughout the galaxy. Ahead, you will find the inner chamber of the vault, but also another test, 
I can only trust this holocron to someone who has followed my path and understands. So we hear a recording from Eno Cordova, who was a Jedi, and we find out that there is a list of four sensitive children to basically rebuild the Jedi Order all across the galaxies, which is probably really important for the Jedi, but also something that maybe the Sith are going to try to go after. BD-1 was, in fact, the thing that we were looking for all this time. We thought we were going to see a Jedi. We only see an image or a projection of a Jedi, and BD-1 is the one who has all the information locked within him. Yeah, uh, which is, I mean, I thought that was pretty obvious that, like, when Sears, like, there's someone that you need to meet. I thought it was BD-1 from the start, but now we know for sure that's what's happening. And now that knowing that there's this list that exists, I'm kind of hesitant with Seer because, like you mentioned, that is something that a Sith would want as well. Hmm. So now you don't trust Seer as much. Interesting. No. Uh, we have to travel to three temples is what Cordova said. Cal is, I think he's gung-ho on this. He keeps having visions about Prof saying, find your destiny, uh, which I think is really important to him. I think he wants to find his purpose as a Jedi. He doesn't want to hide anymore. This is, again, it's, it's very brief and it happens so fast, but this is the general thought, especially with these flashbacks that I'm feeling from Cal. Do you agree or, or disagree? Yeah, I, I agree with that. That makes sense. He mentions the Zepho as well, ancient people that have ties to the Force. We also see another transmission where he talks about going to Dathomir, which is really cool because if you don't know, that's the birthplace of the Zabrak people who look like Darth Maul. If you've watched The Clone Wars as well, he has an entire family and they're pretty crazy and uh, they're like warriors and they're almost like yeah. the Mandalorians. They're very vicious and stuff like that. So I'm really excited to dive into that I'm scared. as well. <laughs> you are? <laughs> yeah. Darth Maul is scary. I don't want to see more of Darth Maul's people that will like kill me as a Jedi. Yeah, they're probably going to be really strong, and we're probably going to die a lot playing this game. Uh, once we're done, though, we head back to the ship and tell the crew what we saw. What did he hide inside? A holocron from the archives. It contains a list of four sensitive children. <sighs> the next generation of Jedi. I knew it! Oh, Cordova, you old fool. You knew him? Yes. A long time ago. I was his apprentice. Cordova was a loner. And that little droid and I are probably the only ones that know about Pagano. Hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. A holo what? A holocron. It stores information, but only accessible to Jedi. Hang on, I think I have one around here. Use the Force. This is Master Obi-Wan Kenobi. I regret to report that both our Jedi Order and the Republic have fallen. So Seer was actually Eno's apprentice. And this sounds strange because, again, she kind of knows what's going on, but is sending Cal to all to do all this stuff. Again, this is where I, I kind of am skeptical of, of Seer at this point because how does she know all this information? But she goes to tell Cal to find more of this stuff. It seems strange to me. Yeah, it's really weird. We don't know why she isn't a Jedi anymore. And she's not telling us. And instead needs to use another Jedi. Yes. Kind of fishy. And she also mentions how she had an experience that made her cut herself off from being a Jedi. So, I don't know. Sith, Sith, Sith. All right. That's what our... <laughs> That is what our, we're going to think that she's a fifth for now. So we're going to put that down. Yeah. If we're wrong, we're sorry. Uh, we also get a glimpse into Obi-Wan's message, which is cool because we get that kind of cameo from uh, one of the original characters from Star Wars, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, I like that as well. Because it was it, that is the message he sends at the end of Revenge yes. of the it's, Sith. It's the same yeah. message, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, but that's it for chapter one. We're on the ship and it's on to Zepho. The planet or Dathomir, but apparently Dathomir is harder. Uh, walkthroughs tell you to go to Zepho. So go to Zepho because that's where we're going next on Autosave in Chapter 2. But after the break, we talk mechanics, game controls, story, and why we don't like Cal's face.
Okay, Cam, initial thoughts on Cal as the main character. I know you don't like his face, but I, as a I character, don't like his face. Yeah, I know. I'm gonna keep drilling it in, into you. I'm just <laughs> kidding. I, anyway, what do you think of him as a main character? Um, I'm not so sold on him. So I agree with yeah. kind of how you're feeling on him as a character. It just seems like very like normal, like a normal. I'm a normal Jedi that ran away and it's hiding. Like, I don't know. There, maybe there's like lack of excitement, but maybe I'm just looking for more of a connection to Cal just because we were thrown into it and we already kind of know so much. We never had that like ability to learn more about him as a person uh, mm-hmm. to connect with him further. So I think that may be it for me. But I'm hopeful. Like, I do think it's interesting that we are seeing these flashbacks with his master. And I hope that reveals more about who he is as a character. Maybe that relationship and whatever happened to that relationship will let us connect with him better. Because we get a glimpse of that, too, when he's with Seer and he's like, you know, he survived. Like, he's kind of traumatized because he survived Order 66. So I think we're going to see later in the game what that looked like to him maybe in a flashback. So we we kind of talked about, you know, the super fast paced chapter one. I get having you want a, an action packed chapter one, but I still feel like they rushed the initial like yeah. all of a sudden we're fighting the second sister. And to me, I feel like I need a little bit more backstory. They could have drawn out the first act a little bit more in this chapter one, in my opinion, at least where we got to know a little bit more about him. Yeah, they could have built it up a lot more, I think. Graphics and controls. The lightsaber mechanics, I think, are very light and they feel free. And I really do like lightsaber fighting in this game. I don't have an issue with that. We see climbing in almost every game ever now. Where has climbing become such a big thing in every aspect of games? Like, does Cal really need to climb in this game? I don't think so. No, probably not. But I do, I would say that... I do like how they use climbing. Like, I think it makes it more interesting than, like, say, walking through the train. I like that you have to climb on the outside of the train, and it it just gives it more variety of the gameplay um, because the other parts of the traversal mechanics does seem a little bit heavy. Uh, So we mentioned lightsaber mechanics. Are there anything else that you want to mention that we missed? I guess, the again, the graphics are not bad. Like, they do seem... Like they, the mocap is okay, but the the worlds are really beautiful, right? Really beautiful, really, really beautiful. Bogang, Bogango, Be- oh my god, I'm gonna Bogano, sorry, like Bogano. Thank you. I'm gonna like butcher every single uh, Tatooine name place, uh, <laughs> Tatooine. Uh, but it's beautiful when you land on it, and you just see like the sun, and it's great. But for some reason, with the character designs. And, but it's not even just characters. It's like the human characters are weird. The aliens. Grease looks amazing. Right? Yeah. BD1 so it, looks great. It's just weird. Yeah. There's just something off. It's it's not quite perfect. Yeah. Does it have to be do with a lot of games, their faces, they can't emote properly, right? Mm-hmm. That's the thing that they're still trying to figure out. And I feel with this game too, it's like they're trying to be emotional, but their faces are still so stoic. Yeah. Yeah. So that might be the reason. Okay, that's it for us, I guess. There's nothing else that we want to talk about. We're still super excited. Again, we don't want to say that we don't want to play this game. This is a great game, and I already had fun in Chapter 1. But if it does have difficulties going through the game, if we have problems, uh, we want to solve these problems or talk more about it because you know not every game is perfect. And we are super excited to still play this game and and tell us what we really think by the end of it and how uh, everything comes out and plays. I'm excited. We'll see where this goes. We'll see if we see any big characters also come in the Star Wars uh, saga, at least. I'm, I'm hoping we see maybe a baby Han Solo, <laughs> maybe uh, a ghost Padme. You never know. You never know. Because, okay. again, this is still in, I think it's canon. This is a canon game. Yeah, I game. think it is canon, yeah. So I'm really excited what happens with the rest. Uh, but off to Zepho in Chapter 2 next time on Autosave. Autosave is produced and hosted by Camille Salazar-Hadaway and myself, Nick Andrade. The show is also produced by Dylan Wilson. Gameplay and additional elements provided by Chris Seitzer. Technical production by Greg Fillion. Executive producer, Clayton Hansler. 
You can follow the show at Autosave Podcast on Twitter and Autosave Pod on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch. You can subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to it right now, and if it happens to be Apple Podcasts, kindly leave us a rating and review, but only if it's good. Autosave is a Soda original, hosted on the Soda Podcast Network.